program is called Something to Talk About, and it's from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. It is sponsored by Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island, which uh, accepts residents on Rolling Bay. They have uh, memory care, and they are building an assisted living and independent living facility as well. To learn more about those uh, activities, plus day stay and respite programs, call 360-689-4314. Today is Tech Talk, Tech Talk, not Tick Talk, Tech Talk with uh, John Chen. And uh, what have we got in store this month, John? Well, I am looking at uh, focusing on some of the typical products that people use in an office environment and to see how they can apply to home, like word processing, like spreadsheets, and they are not as complex as what pe how people think they are. So I'm going to touch on that. And there's a lot, also a lot of questions about email, uh, how people retrieve their email. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that too. And um, if uh, you'll permit me, I'm going to get the presentation going. Yeah. I may have some glitches. <laughs> that's that's the other thing that we have to be familiar with when it comes to technology is if it does not work the first time you have yeah. to try another way okay first i'm going to fo focus on office products for use at home and the devices all of these topic will apply to will be windows pcs apple macs chromebooks android phone, and tablets. It's not going to be anything specific. And <clears throat> hang on. Uh, for some reason, I can't see anybody other than I can see what I'm presenting. Oh, that's funny. Well, we're here and I'll let you know. All right. First, let's talk about word processing or text processing as many of us also knows it as. Most people think <clears throat> word processing applies really to offices. And many people will say, well, uh, I use email and I use email to write letters. But how about things like when you write letters, recipes, any diary or tr travel log or your email. And the advantage of you writing something in Word or text processing software is that it can check spelling for you. You'll check your grammar and your punctuations. And if you have uh, some need to format a paragraph uh, instead of just one uh, one long paragraph that rambles on. You can use word processing for formatting paragraphs and bullets, line items, or any kind of tables, charts. Uh, for example, you can use word processing to make signs for your garage sales. And most pro word processing software has a dictionary checker, but Many, uh, quite often, people have words that's not in the standard dictionary, like uh, BI Senior Center, BI SCC. And so you can teach your dictionary in your word processing software, BI SCC, so it's, it won't flag it as a misspelling or change it to something else. Spreadsheets, that doesn't always mean accounting numbers or math related because many people do think that, oh, I don't use spreadsheet because I don't do any kind of accounting. Well, spreadsheet can often be used for a log or a journal. For example, <clears throat> anything that you want to write up or keep track of that has columns and rows. You can track, for example, daily exercises, uh, expense budget, or medication. So you can say one column can be the date, next column can be medication A, next column can be medication B, 
And anytime you take one, you can put an X in that little, little square. So <clears throat> spreadsheet has a lot of other uses. Okay. Products. What are some of the products out there? Most commonly known is Microsoft Office. And that consists of Outlook, which is the mail software, Word for word processing or writing any kind of document, Excel, which is their spreadsheet or any kind of rows and column tracking software. Uh, PowerPoint is for anyone who wants to create a presentation like the one you're seeing right now. And <clears throat> Microsoft Office over the years, they have, they have gone through a different number of different iterations of cost. Sometimes it will be zero cost uh, or maybe six to 10 bucks a month or $60, $70 a year fee. So that changes quite often. And so you just have to look at what package Microsoft is currently offering. Apple has Mail, Pages, which is a word processing software, Numbers, which is a spreadsheet calculating or rows and column type of a software, Keynote, is similar to what I'm doing right now, which is a presentation and also uh, photo editing. Now from Apple, it's free. It's part of the uh, package when you buy an iPhone or a Mac or a pad, it comes with those products and no charge. Google, they have become a major office product supplier. And Google has mail. Uh, you know, they also have a whole suite of products designed to be word processing, spreadsheet, or presentation. But Google Office uses a, your browser on your computer as a main interface. There are other uh, suites of Office products available. One is called LibreOffice. Uh, Libre is zero uh, cost. It runs on PCs, runs on Macs, and I believe it runs on Chromebook. Uh, I'm not sure about running on Android, but again, LibreOffice uh, is a text document writer a spreadsheet, a presentation, and drawing. Then there's open office. I'm not sure how, how current they are. Uh, maybe about four or five years ago, they started um, reducing their products. And I'm not even sure at this point if they are still a viable product or they pretty much have been folded into LibreOffice. And by the way, LibreOffice and OpenOffice, they are free and there is no one specific company that creates them. It's the general internet public. And so <clears throat> everyone contributes to it. And uh, so if you do find that there is a, a bug of some kind, there are millions of people out there that will volunteer and they will fix it. And so those two products are uh, very viable. In fact, in Europe, the major product that's used over there is Libre. And by the way, I have switched from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice and Apple products. And so those two are my Current so primary I yes. just did I just did a little web search while you were talking. Uh -huh. And, and LibreOffice, which is at LibreOffice.org, has a page that describes system requirements for Microsoft Windows, uh, the map, the Apple or Mac OS, uh, Linux, Android, and other OSs. 
So you can uh, check it out to see if it works with whatever kind of a system <clears throat> you're working with. And uh, great. And there's one key thing at the, I always try to remind people that if you're gonna pick a product, always try to remember who you normally communicate with. If let's say you work for a company or you frequently work with some organization and within that organization, let's say they use Microsoft Office. So whatever you do, you whatever software you pick, you should be able to create Microsoft Office compatible files. So if you create a document, you send it to that organization, it will be great if they can read it. So <clears throat> always double check uh, because not all software are compatible. Let's say you write a document and you send it to your brother or your sister. Well, they use a different product, so they may or may not be able to read what you have sent them. However, most products will always be able to save files that's compatible in other formats, such as Libre. In Libre, you can say, okay, every file I create, it will always go to uh, Microsoft Office format. All right. So if, you, if that's what you want, you can set that up. And at, from that point on, you will essentially be creating and retrieving off, uh, Microsoft Office format data. Okay, this is a, a sort of a tricky topic that comes to, especially to uh, uh, mail. A lot of people have heard about client and server. And what does that really mean? Well, over here on the left, you will see de devices that you normally use day to day. You have a phone of some kind, a laptop, or you have a desktop, or you may have a tablet. They will communicate with something called the internet. Think of it as a big cloud. On the other side of that is a server. That's where all, when you hear uh, the data is saved in a cloud or your mail is being saved someplace, that's where the, your data is actually being saved. Now, obviously the, in this picture, this could be you or your household, and this could be at google.com. Now let's go take one step further. In this example, there are a whole bunch of households, whole bunch of computers. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a old slide. He also has a Blackberry, which doesn't exist anymore. So these, this could be a company, uh, could be a law office or some realtor office. And there are thousands of these across the country. Now imagine there are millions of households and they all use something called Gmail, Google Mail. And this is where Google stores their data. You don't know where it is. You just know it's someplace that is connected to the internet. Okay, why am I bringing this up? Mail, <clears throat> when you have paper mail, meaning what you get uh, from the post office, you can get your mail, paper mail, in front of your house in a mailbox. There is, um, you can also get a post office box, which is in downtown Winslow, or you can rent a box over a UPS box on High School Road, or you can use some kind of other kind of private mail service. Now, try to think of all of these, each one of these as a mail server, because that's where you go to get your mail. So these are the equivalent. 
for email servers. There is iCloud for Apple. Microsoft has something called MSN or Hotmail or Outlook. Google has Gmail. Yahoo has Yahoo Mail. Uh, here's the old one, which is America Online. And there are a whole slew of others. Now, try to think of each one of these the same as each one of these. Now, what do you have to do if you want to get your mail today? You walk out to the street, you go to here to retrieve your mail. Then you get in your car, go to the post office and get whatever's in your post office box. You may have a UPS box. So you go to the UPS store and retrieve your mail. So every day, if you want all of your mail, you have to do all of those things, just like for each one of these. You have to go to each one of these to retrieve your mail. So how do you get at your mail? Many people use something called a browser, uh, which is for Apple, it's called Safari. Google, you can use Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge. All of these are browsers. It means they have no specific purpose other than take you, whatever you type, send it to some place and get whatever that some place has to offer, retrieve it back and put it back on your computer. <clears throat> then there are things called client applications, meaning a piece of software that's specifically designed to retrieve mail. From Apple, it's called Apple Mail. Then from Google, you can download an app called Google Gmail. Microsoft has something called Outlook. Then there's Thunderbird and there are a number of others. How are they, these two different? Browser, they're free. Every soft computer that you buy or every uh, phone you get has a browser in it. You can use a browser to retrieve your mail from a mailbox from server. And But if you want to look at your mail, you have to be connected to the internet. It means that if you're in an airplane and you don't have internet access, you usually will not be able to look at your mail. And email is not saved on the device that you're, you have your hands on right now. For a client app, it's free. Some may or may not have charges, a monthly charge. And you don't always need internet. You only need internet maybe once a day to retrieve email. So for example, if you're going to fly somewhere, before you get on the airport, you connect to your mail server, retrieve your mail, saved onto your device. And when you're on the airplane, you can actually read your mail, write your mail. And when you get off the plane at the other end, at that point, it can reconnect to the internet and send all of your mail. Saying all the email that you have are actually saved on your device. Okay. Again, we have browsers. Now imagine each one of these being a server, a mail server of some kind. Let's assume this is Apple iCloud. You use a phone to retrieve your Apple iCloud. I have actually met a number of people who says, I use my phone for my iCloud and I go over to my Mac to retrieve the mail that is in Microsoft or Google. And I use tablet to retrieve email from Gmail or Yahoo Mail. So they use a different device to retrieve different email, which is extremely cumbersome. For client, this is what happens. 
you have one piece of software that can talk to iCloud, can talk to Microsoft, can talk to Gmail, Yahoo, and anything else out here, retrieve it and bring it into inside of a piece of software. Now, compare this to this. It's the same thing as comparing this to, let's say, every day you send a neighborhood kid to your street mailbox, to the post office, to UPS store, retrieve all of your mail, bring it back to your house and hand it to you. So you don't have to worry about doing each one of these individually. You have a piece of software that goes out, do it for you, all right? And all the data email is actually stored on a local hard drive. So this is what I would recommend a lot of people use instead of doing it, retrieving email on a browser, using some kind of browser. Okay, how are they different? <clears throat> people would say, oh, I get a lot of junk mail or spam and I just throw it away. Well, let's let's refine that a little bit. Let's call some some of the email that you get as unwanted mail. All right. Let's say you normally do business with uh, uh, TNC in downtown Winslow, but every week they send you a weekly special, or you do business with Social Security. They also send you email about the benefits or things that you should be doing or not doing. So some, so these email are from company that you normally do business with, but they're sending you more than you really want. So you can't, you shouldn't say, oh, I got a social security uh, newsletter. It's junk. So I'm going to call it junk and I'm gonna get rid of it. So be careful because the software you're using, whether it be browser software or app software, it will learn what you considered as junk. So after a while, if you keep on saying all the letters from social security are junk, eventually the software is going to say, oh, I got another email for you from Social Security, and it's going to be junk. It may be something very important. All right. So let's say unwanted mail are not junk mail. They are legit. It's just that you don't want it. Then there's mail called that's really junk or spam. Now, junk mail and spam mail are not normal, are normally not. Uh, bad mail. They are just mail from company you don't do business with, or uh, let's say some store that you normally buy things from, and you have an account there, but they send out daily mail to thousands and thousands of customers. Or let's say a roofing company decides to send you email about getting a new roof. All right. You don't want a new roof. So they're kind of like unwanted mail, but they, you don't do any businesses with them. So you call it junk or spam. Then we have vicious email or malicious email that actually try to hide themselves and disguise themselves as a bank or as a, some, some well-known store and hoping that you will click on something on that screen. And let's say it's, a, it's from uh, some uh, box store and they will send you something that looks like it's from that box store. 
they're just hoping that you'll click on it and they'll, it will take you to a, a page that looks like it's really from that same box store. And it's trying to get information from you, like your credit card number, like, uh, oh, your recent purchase was not good, or they have some questions. So they want you to type in your credit card number or your birthday or bank account, et cetera. So those are actually uh, malicious email and we call them phishing. Okay, how do you safely sub unsubscribe an email? Quite often on all of these email, on the bottom, you'll see a line that says, click here to unsubscribe, meaning you don't want to get it anymore. I normally do not click on anything that is on any screen. If I wanted to unsubscribe something, let's say from a, a big box store, I will actually not look at the email and actually go to that store's main page and sign on with my normal ID and go into my account and change notification options to say, I don't want uh, uh sales flyers and etc. That is a lot safer way to go than clicking on any email that you don't have any idea who it's really from. Okay. So how do you manage or organize email to clean it up? I I know people whose inbox may have thousands and thousands of old email and they don't know what to do with it. Okay. You can sort your inbox by some field. For example, <clears throat> you can the email are normally in some kind of sequence. It's usually by date and time. So the email that you got a few seconds ago, it's sitting right at the top. And the ones that you got yesterday will be below that and below that, et cetera. You can tell it to sort your inbox by name or who it's from or who it's to or the subject line, uh, anything you have already read or you haven't, haven't yet read it yet. So you can sort it. That's, what, that's one way to organize your email so it's easier for you to work with. Or if you'd like, you can tag every email if your software allows it. Like you can tag an email red for medical stuff, blue for something, yellow for something, whatever number, whatever color you want to use for whatever purpose you want to use. And for Apple Mail, uh, they do use the word tag and they do use different colors. Or what you can do is create a different folder. Think and in, in Apple Mail, they call it a mailbox. And essentially it's your file folder. So you can create a mailbox called BI Senior Center, BI SCC. And every email you get from the senior center, you can actually move them into this folder. So you can have one. A uh, photo for your friends, one photo for the family. Uh, however you want to set up your file folder, you can do that. And usually there's no limit in how many folders you can create. And on all of them, you can have folders inside of a folder. For example, you can have a folder called organizations. And inside of that, you can have one folder for BI Senior Center, another subfolder for uh, Social Security, another folder for uh, Fish Line, or anything you choose. So <clears throat> that's an easy way to at least separate all the emails. Then there is something called the Smart Folders. 
that's available on Apple. And Microsoft also has something, I'm not sure what they call it. And you can do a search on that. Example, I want, if I wanna show every single mail from my inbox, all of my inbox that has BISCC in it. All right. So I don't have to sort my uh, inbox. I just have to create a smart folder. And with each smart folder, you can, you can specify a whole series of criteria. For example, if any mail that comes in has BISCC in the subject line, that is from the senior center. Or if I have any email that comes in with Reed's name on it as a from, I will throw that in there. Or any email that has that I wrote to Reed. And so Reed is in the recipients field. I'll throw that in there. And let's say Mary, I'll have a test for Mary. And so if I go to the smart folder, it will show me every email I have in my entire mailbox that has those criteria in it. And that is just an easy way for you to create a, a folder that's not really a folder. It's just, uh, think of that neighborhood kid that you sent to get all of your paper mail from. Let's say that you tell that kid, okay, sort all the my daily email and put it in these stacks so it's easier for me to look at. And that's exactly what the smart folder is. Okay, so in this example, uh, in the mailbox, down here, you can say new smart mailbox. And if you click on this, it, you will then be able to uh, I specify the criteria, like the subject line, the recipient, the sender, et cetera. Or you can go into messages and there's a flag and under the flag, you can click on orange, red, any kind of color. By the way, you can have multiple type of mail as red. If you want to use red for, let's say, medical and for anything else, you don't have to use one color for, it, for a specific item. You can use it for anything you like. Okay, there are other things that's also related to mail. Uh, usually all the mail account also has calendar. Um, they are closely related. You can you create a calendar and the mail software will automatically take entries in the calendar, send it to people. Um, Let's say you have a calendar entry that you are, you are inviting friends over for a party and you can have an email system, take all the recipients, send them reminders out of your calendar. Obviously, in order for email to know who to send it to, you have contacts. So contact is usually part of the mail account. So... <clears throat> Uh, there's also reminders that's for yourself. Uh, you can set up daily reminders, monthly or every two weeks. Uh, you can set up any some kind of do list and any kind of notes. And they can be used for anything you want to use it for. Now, just by what I have talked about so far, there are a lot of personal information all attached to your mail account. So one thing you should always do is use some secure password to get into your account because you don't want someone else to be able to get into your account without you knowing it. Okay, photo basics. Uh, I'm just gonna touch on some 
very basic terminology for photos. And uh, we'll go into more detail in the future, future weeks. Okay. A lot of times when you get a picture from some friends, it looks very fuzzy. And that has to do with number of little dots that composes in that photograph. And it's a terminology called PPI, pixel per inch. Now, the, the, the one PPI, that's an exaggeration. That means in one inch, you have one dot. Or two PPI, it's two by two. So in one inch square, you have actually, actually have four dots. Uh, each dot can be a different color, right? Or a single color, like if you're taking a picture of clouds, it may all be white. Or one may be a little more gray, another one may be blue. So then we have four PPI. These are just examples, they are not real. Uh, four PPI, four by four, so there are 16 dots in one square inch. So the picture you look at will be clearer, more precise, sharp. And then we have a PPI. Now, something that is very low density, let's say, I, I don't, I'm not even gonna guess what PPI this is, but if it's very low, you will see a lot of pixel, it's called pixelation. And it's not very clear, not very sharp. And the higher density you go, the sharper something becomes. And then in this case, we have a low density, medium density, and high density. Obviously, something that has a very high density require more computer bits to represent it. Right. And which means that picture is going to be bigger in terms of stored on your, on your hard drive. Some very basic terminologies. File type are usually something called JPG or PNG. And these are the three characters at the end of a name of a file. And it's just a standard that somebody created years and years ago that says JPG or photo related graphics. And PNG is a different kind. And file size are usually measured in width and height. Earlier we looked at four by four or 10 by 10. But usually uh, <clears throat> photographs is kind of like a widescreen TV. It's wider than it is high. So in this case, we have 2049 little dots across the screen and 1536 from the bottom to the top. And the most common one is 72 little dots per inch. Okay. This is where people get confused and they interchange these uh, dots. Dots per inch is the number of dots in one inch of image printed on a piece of paper by a printer. PPI is a number of pixels or dots in one inch of image on a screen monitor. So <clears throat> to, to explain DPI, let's say if you print a photo of, let's say a boat on a piece of paper and you use a very high DPI, that means for in one inch, it's gonna have a lot of little dots it's going to use up more ink to print that picture of a boat. 
but that picture will be extremely clear and crisp. All right. Versus fewer dots, that means less ink, but when you look at the picture, it's going to be very jaggly. Now, all the software that comes on your computer can do some very common things. Most, most thing that uh, people want to do is to crop a picture. Let's say you take a picture with your phone and parts of that picture are things that you don't really want and they're to the side of the picture. So you can crop it, meaning chop parts of it off. Another one that's frequently used is straighten. Quite often, you'll take a picture of a boat on the water, but the water isn't level. It looks like it's going downhill right, or going uphill. Or you take a picture of a, a car going down the street and the phone, uh, the utility poles on the side of the street are not sticking straight up, it's at an angle. So you can use your photo software to straighten, to rotate, or flip. Flip meaning right it becomes left, left becomes right. It's kind of like uh, when you look at something in the mirror of yourself, your right is on the right, but it looks like it's on the left. <clears throat> so that flips it around. Resize is, let's say you take a picture of something that is very high resolution and you want to, and it's also physically very big. And it's great for printing a, a photo that's, that's 16 inches by 20 inches but you really want to get a picture printed like a wall of size. So you can resize that picture, meaning the software is gonna take out some dots and to condense and make that actual photo smaller. Let's say you also sometimes will take a picture that is too light or too dark and you want to adjust it. Most modern phones, can automatically do that and it will take the best picture it can for you. But if you didn't like it, you can make it lighter or darker, or you can brighten it and you can have create more contrast. So the high between, between the light and dark of a single image, you want the shadow to be darker, you want the sunlight part to be brighter. So that's the contrast. One that's not often available for the free soft free software that you get for your uh, for free on your Mac or on your Windows PC, which is to heal, repair, or scratch. For example, if you take a photo, paper photo, and you got out of your closet and it had accidentally been folded, so you see it lined across it, uh, or you. As somebody actually scratched a photo, there are software that can actually take the scratches out or repair a crease or a fold in the photo. Now, let's say there is a scratch. That means there are actual color in that photo that's been removed. So you may say, well, where does it get the picture from? Well, it makes it up. It makes it up by looking at the colors right next to the scratch and assume the color is the same. Now, so it doesn't do a perfect job, but it does, a, it does do a decent job. So basic software that comes with your machine. For Apple, it's called Photos. In fact, it's called Photos for every one of these. Apple has Photo, Google Photo, Amazon, Window, they all have a piece of software that can do some basic photo editing. And then there are advanced and more full featured, and you usually have to pay for them. Uh, Photoshop is probably the most well-known and it's been around for ages. They do have a free trial 
but if you want a complete version, you got to pay for it. And Pixelmator is a is also a free trial, or there is a light version that you, you can get it for free. But and it does do quite a bit. But if you really want a full feature software, you will have to pay for it. And I think Pixelmator is a purchase of twenty nine dollars or some or or thirty nine dollars. And it can it can do a whole slew of things, which I'm not even going to go into at this point. But it, both of them are excellent software. John, and, can I pop in here? Sure. So I'm wondering with, um, you know, one of the things that uh, is challenging about the photo software that doesn't come with my device is often Photoshop for sure can be so overwhelming that uh, I don't even know where to begin. Do you use uh, anything beyond what Apple gives you or is that for you enough? Yes, I do. And um, I used to use Photoshop and yes, I paid for it. And yes, you can do a whole lot of other things, but a lot of things on in Photoshop, I still don't know how to use. Right. Then I came across Pixelmator, mainly because I didn't feel like paying for Photoshop anymore. Pixelmator is a good alternative to Photoshop, and it also have a whole slew of features, which most of them I still don't know how to use. But I do use some very common ones, for example, if I have a picture, I want to extract a person or extract an object out of one picture and stick it into another picture. Or uh, sometimes I would take a picture that is slightly distorted because I'm shooting up a, um, a skyscraper and it gets distorted. Or if I my phone's camera is using a wide angle to take a picture of a person's face and the person comes out as a really big nose and, or big eyes and it's just a, not a normal face. If I want to be able to kind of like stretch part of the picture, I at that point I would use Pixelmator. And I do not use Photoshops anymore. And mainly because I like Pixelmator. Uh, it may not be as intuitive, uh, meaning that you may have to, to, to learn a bit more. Uh, but once you have learned some of those skills that you do most, that you use most often, uh, it becomes second nature. And my wife also uses Pixelmator and she also used to use Photoshop. And both of us have uh, transitioned to Pixelmator. Uh, it is a one-time purchase and we've had it for maybe five, six years. And uh, we have not yet had to pay any additional cost to Pixelmator. But I do contribute every once in a while to Pixelmator and uh, just send them some additional money so they can keep on working on better features uh, or improve the features, et cetera. So yes, uh, Photoshop is definitely more expensive. Pixelmator is a lot less expensive and it's a, also a one-time paid version. Yeah. I appreciate that. <clears throat> And thank you, John. Um, we'll talk again next month on this program, but we'll see you sooner than that here at the okay. Center. Yep.